We sure glad to see all of you here tonight. I know we'll probably have more folks filtering on in. I know I've had two or three people say they couldn't get here right at 6.30, but they would get here quick as they could. And we sure glad you're here tonight. Um, right now, I don't know if we'll have the kids go out. Uh, Miss Jessica said if it was only the three children here, that we'd probably just stay in here, let them stay in here tonight and not do anything with the children in the back. But uh, for those of you that are, hadn't been here, if it's your first night, welcome, come. Welcome here, and uh, we've been having stuff in the back for kids and good groups out here, and so I pray that God speaks to us tonight through Brother Harold Peasley. Uh, in the back on that table in the foyer is a book that Brother Harold has written about evangelism, kind of keeping the main thing the main thing, and uh, not losing your focus as a church, and he'll say more about that book in a minute, and you can get one from him at the end of the service today if you want tonight if you want to. And uh, he just takes donations for that. But uh, whatever, uh, you know, that's one of the things. I think if we all probably graded ourselves on everything churches do, we as churches do, we might give ourselves the lowest grade on evangelism and feeling like we do a good job, you know. And so that's an area we could all be more polished and improved and uh, more passionate about is evangelism. So uh, tonight... Uh, Listen to this man of God, that God has, in his divine plan, has made it possible for him to be here with us this week. And I know that if you've heard him this week, you've been blessed. Amen? Amen. And uh, so I know you'll be blessed tonight. Let me open us in prayer, and I'm going to turn it over to Brother Whalen. Father, we do thank you that tonight we can gather in this place, Lord, a, a place where, God, you've given us a roof to get under and cool surroundings and comfortable pews. But God, may we never be relaxed about spiritual things. May we, God, be bothered a little bit, challenged a little bit to get out of our comfort zones and walk by faith. Oh, God, tonight we'd ask you to stir our hearts with the message that you have for us from your messenger. God, I pray that this campus would be holy ground here tonight. God, that you would move in our hearts. We've come here, Lord, because we need to hear from you. We ask you, O oh Lord, to stir us, to move in us, to speak to us, and help us, Lord, to, to adjust our lives, to bring glory and honor to you. God, we commit this time to you. Have your way through the music, through the message. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I stand amazed in the presence. Let's sing it out. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me. A sinner condemned unto How marvelous, how wonderful, and my 
flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, in darkness of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Those sorrows befall us and evil oppose God leads his dear children along through grace we can conquer defeat all our foes God leads his dear children along come through the water some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day. Thank you so much. And every line is just packed full of truth and reality. And in those dark seasons, uh, what a testimony to be able to sing, God leads us along. Amen. Thank you for that. Couldn't have chosen a better song and so appreciate it. Well, tonight I want to greet you all in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. You're getting it slowly, <laughs> but anyway, that's true. It is just a joy to greet you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. I'm delighted to be with you again this evening. Uh, sometimes these services just go so quickly, and then they buy, and you're just getting to know and love the people, and off we go. Uh, but these have been some lovely days, and I have certainly appreciated it. Very much. Each October, I come down for 
various meetings, and there was this gap, and I wondered, where can I go? Where is there a possibility to minister? And God opened the door, and Brother Mike begged and begged and begged, and I said, <laughs> no, he didn't. I begged him. <laughs> Listen, you've got a great couple here, Ray. Now, you look after them, otherwise I'm taking them back to Canada with me. Is that right? <laughs> Brother Mike. I said that in one church, and some lady said, Amen. <laughs> but I sense a wonderful spirit of love here in the congregation, one toward the other, pastoral couple with the people and you together with them. And that's how it ought to be, because God brings it all together. And what a joy, and I really sense that God has got something special for this lovely church uh, in the days that lie ahead. Uh, you know, I was telling the, and my, by the way, that lunch today was fantastic. Uh, you talk about young at heart. <laughs> it's young in hunger, I think, there, you know. <laughs> Capacity to enjoy the meal was excellent. Now, I was telling them today about Dr. Billy Graham and how he was experiencing a restaurant. They tell us that when he was a, a young preacher, just starting off, that he was preaching in a certain town, and um, he was preaching in the town hall, it was an evangelistic crusade, and uh, he'd walk down to, on the Monday morning, obviously, to the, to the little town, little village, and uh, he, he was wanting to post a letter to his wife those days, you know, the he had to write letters, and... Um, he saw a little fellow and he said, Hey, sonny boy, where, where is the post office here? And uh, the guy said, are, are you a visitor here, a stranger? You don't know where the post office is? He said, Yes. He said, Well, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to preach the gospel. He said, Where are you preaching? He said, I'm preaching in the town hall. He said, Well, what do you preach about? He said, I preach about how you can go to heaven. He said, You must come and hear me preach about how you can go to heaven. He said, so you don't even know where the post office is. What about heaven? <laughs> so you need to know. <laughs> well, we've been following a little bit of a theme, and the theme has been good news for modern man, and we've looked at different aspects uh, of modern man. And we looked the other night, uh, Sunday night, on... Uh, with good news in the valley. And then last night, in the Supreme Court. Now tonight, I want us to look at another aspect of good news, as we have it in the Bible, and that's good news at the seaside. And there are some interesting places in the Bible as far as good news was concerned at the seaside. Let me mention some of them by way of introduction here this evening. First of all, there was good news at the Red Sea. You remember the story of the Red Sea? What happened there? The children of Israel had come out of Egypt. They were being followed by the Egyptians, and so they were trying to move. Remember, it was two million of them they were trying to move as fast as they could, and then they came to a blockage. And the blockage was the Red Sea. The Egyptians behind them, Red Sea in front of them, and either side the desert. And uh, what was going to happen? And they call on the name of the Lord. And God came back with good news. And the good news was, proceed across the Red Sea, and we know the amazing miracle that took place at the Red Sea. And then, you know, if you go into the New Testament, it was around that beautiful, picturesque place of the Sea of Galilee, where the Lord Jesus walked. And as he walked, he met with men that were busy in their profession, and their profession was fishing. And he called them one by one and brothers at a time and said, Come, follow me, and I'll make you to become good Baptists. Is that what he said? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
follow me and I'll make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Didn't say that, eh? He said, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. There at the seaside, good news suddenly came to these men busy in their fishing business. That verse tells us that if I follow the Lord Jesus, what will I become? A fisher of men. Is that right? And if you take the verse some more, if I am a fisher of men, what does that verse teach me? I am a follower of the Lord Jesus. Is that right? Therefore, if I am not a fisher of men, then what does that verse say? I am not a true follower of the Lord Jesus. And you know, there are many today who claim to be followers, but in actual fact, their following stops there, and they're not fishers of men. There was another instance on the other side of the Galilee where the Lord Jesus brought good news. It was to a man of Gadara, Gadara. Here was a man possessed by an evil spirit. Nobody liked him. They bound him with chains. They tried to confine him to the graveyard. And one day, this man met the Lord Jesus, and his entire life was changed. Whereas he was wild and reckless, they found him sitting at the feet of Jesus, a completely different man. Good news there at the seaside. And then if you go to, to Israel and you look over the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, you sit on a little hill which is called the Hill or the Mount of Beatitudes. You, you've been to that, haven't you? And there you can see how the Lord Jesus sat and the crowd was before him towards the water, and his voice carried, carried down the valley into, where, into the ears of those that were listening to him. And he could have spoken to easy five, ten thousand people as they gathered by the seaside. And then you will remember that Peter was at the seaside when he had a remarkable revelation. He was in the home of Joppa. And he had this vision of animals coming down that he was supposed to, was called upon to eat. And he said, but I'm told I can't eat that. And the voice said, what God has cleansed, don't call evil. And he was to learn because at the same time, there was a man by the name of Cornelius, 60 miles up from Joppa, a place called Caesarea. And he was told to go and collect a man called Peter and bring him to where they were. And so there at the, at the seaport of Joppa, he learns a lesson that the gospel wasn't only to the Jews, but the gospel was to the Gentiles. And off he went to the Roman port at the seaside in Caesarea and preached the gospel, and there was a first revival Amongst the Gentiles, it was good news as far as Cornelius and his family and hosts were concerned. I want to speak this evening about two other experiences at the seaside. And the first, and if you will turn in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel in chapter 5, and then keep it open because we want to look at this first one and then we've got a second one as they are the two of them are connected. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 1 and uh, we'll go through to verse 11 and you'll sense as we read it, it is just so self-explanatory. So what do we do when we read the Word? We stand, don't we? Thank you in honor of God's holy Word. Luke 5, verse 1, So it was as the multitude pressed about him, that's Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, or the lake of the Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, 
and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they'd done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astounded at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they brought their nets to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Picture the scene. The crowds had gathered. Jesus gets into a boat, so he's a little bit away from them, so he can speak to them, so they can hear him clearly. And when he had finished, the Lord Jesus wanted to teach the disciples a very important lesson. And this first scene at the Sea of Galilee has to do with the whole question of faith. Faith. And so he looks at Simon Peter and he says to him, launch out into the deep. Now you know, this was quite a question. There were a number of reasons uh, that Simon hesitated. The first was, of course, the odds. This was the wrong time to go fishing in the Galilee. Time to go fishing in the Galilee is at night. That's where they caught the fish. But here in the morning, when the sun is beating on the water, that's the wrong time. It was completely against the odds. Not only was it against the odds, but it was against the opinions of the men. You see, these men were seasoned fishermen. They were professionals. And here was a man from Nazareth who was a carpenter, who didn't know too much about fishing as far as they were concerned, and he's telling them what to do. And so if they were going to take a vote on whether they should go fishing or not, these experienced fishermen would have voted completely against what Jesus was requesting of them. And then thirdly, of course, there was the options that they had. The options were pretty clear. They'd been out all night. When you've been out fishing all night, you've caught nothing, you're cold, you're weary, you can't wait to get back to your room and take a hot shower if you can, and have, of course, if you're American, a good cup of coffee, if you're South African, a good cup of tea or something like that, and then you go and have a sleep for the rest of the day. So the options were go out in a boat and catch nothing again, the Lord doesn't really know what he's talking about, or go back home. And so they faced with all these things as the Lord Jesus puts the request to them about going out into the deep. You see, the Lord Jesus sometimes comes to your life and he comes to my life and he poses a question about being obedient to his requests. And his request is always the same. I want you to launch out into the deep. Sometimes that's an individual request. We're busy in life with all our activities, and the Lord says, I want you to change a little bit of direction. We're going to move in an unorthodox manner. We're going to attempt some things which are beyond our own feelings. And he says, I'm asking you to launch out into the deep. This was a question that they were having to deal with. You see, it's called walking by faith and not by feelings. And there is a big difference between the two. 
Feelings have to do with my emotions. Feelings have to do with the way I am prompted. But walking by faith says, I believe God has called me to do this or to do that. Sometimes in some people's lives, it's when they are called into full-time service for the Lord. Others are calling to take on some position in the church or to launch out in some form of activity that can be pleasing and honorable to the Lord. In another instance, it's what's called going the extra mile. It's convenient to go one mile to be of service in one way, but to go the extra mile and inconvenience ourselves and somehow take a backward step It's an unorthodox thing that we called upon to do. And there's a side of me that says, I'll go one mile, but don't expect me to go two miles. In another instance in our lives, launching out into the deep has to do with our giving to God's work. You see, there is what is called giving by revelation or giving by regulation. And regulation is, well, I better give something to the Lord, but not too much. After all, I've got, I've got so many other things, and that's giving by regulation. But by revelation, the Spirit of God comes and says, I want you to launch out into the deep. I want you to give by faith. I want you to be able to say, Lord, in the first place, this is not my money. It's all yours. I'm just the manager. Many have become damages, by the way. And uh, the Lord calls us to be managers of that which He's committed unto us. And He wants us to use it for His work and His kingdom and for the furtherance of His will in our lives. It must not be used just for ourselves and our own particular fancies. It's giving by revelation. And then, of course, it involves a step out of the boat like Peter had to do when he saw the Lord walking on the water. You'll remember when the children of Israel got over, came into the promised land. And as they crossed the Jordan, there was the imposing city of Jericho. Yes, two million Jews that come out of the wilderness, wanderings. They were not an organized army. They knew nothing about strategizing and plan to go into battle and into combat with an enemy. And here was a city that was well stocked with ammunition and had all that was needed to defend their city. And the Lord God comes to Joshua and he says, Joshua, we are not going to fight in the conventional way. I've got another plan. Do you know what the plan is? Joshua said, I haven't got a clue. He said, I've got a better plan than you can ever imagine. I want you to tell this bunch that we're going to walk around the city of of Jericho every day for seven days. We're not going to say a word. And he comes to these to the Israelis and said, okay, boys, put away what you've got, the sticks and stones, your little efforts to fight. Let's walk around. And so they walk around and they wonder what's going on. This is rather unorthodox. They get to the end of the first day and they said, now, Joshua, what did we accomplish today? This is ridiculous. In fact, we're making a fool of ourselves. It's going to be in every paper in the whole of the land of Canaan. What we've been up to, complete failure. He says, do it another time. They went around another time, and another time, and another time. On the last day, when these guys are thoroughly exhausted by now, it's two million of them, man, and they've been going around, and the people of Jericho, you can see that they're getting ready for battle any minute. Joshua says, and the other next instruction is, today is going to be the last day. We're going around seven times. You must be off your nut. What on earth are we going to do? Seven times. He said, in fact, when we go around, we're going to blow the bugles. They didn't have a clue what was going to happen. In an unorthodox way, in a miraculous manner, the Lord led them into battle, and the walls fell flat, and Jericho was taken without a shot being fired, literally. God stepped in. You know, God's got some amazing ways of leading men and women. All He wants from me is to stop trying to plan your own life by yourself, man. 
Start, start strategizing for your own good. Learn to lean upon me. Learn to trust me. There is a way that seems right unto man, the Bible says, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. But when we follow the Lord Jesus and the follow the Lord God, who's got a plan for every one of our lives, I want to tell you what he says to you. I don't know what your situation is, but I'll tell you what God says. Launch out into the deep. Trust me. Go by faith. See what I can do. I can open up a Red Sea that you can go through and bring them a great deliverance against a Jericho that might well be in your life. He's unique and he's unorthodox, but he knows how to lead us. If we'll be sensitive to his promptings and to his direction, launch out into the deep, into the deep, whatever that means. It might be different to me as it may be for you. But God comes, and he comes to your life, and he says, I want you to learn to take the steps of faith. And then I want you to see not only the request that he got, but of course there was the reasoning. And they're all so human. And Peter comes up, and there's what is called human, the human factor. And the human factor was... Lord, it won't work. We're all professionals, as we said. We know how to fish here. We've been out for years into these waters. We know exactly where the fish are and what's gone wrong. We can't explain it. And if we vote tonight, I'm afraid today we are not going to go out. There's always the human factor. Now, there's human people being ridiculous with uh, faith that's not faith. It's some person trying to exercise and copy somebody else. There's always that. But you will know when God's Spirit begins to prompt you. And then when you're in leadership, for instance, in a church, God puts, divi not division, but unity. So, and, in, and as one body, we go forward in whatever the challenge may be. It's easy. It's easy to want to do things my way. Or to do it the traditional way. And God comes in just a different way to lead us along through life. Then there's also the security factor. The Lord Jesus said, launch out into the deep. It would have been far easier to just stay in the shallows. and Catch a few tadpoles and crabs or something like that. If That's what the Lord was saying. And there was more security closer to the shore. Has the Lord asking them to go out into the deep and then to let down the nets. It's one thing to serve the Lord in the shallows. It's another thing to go where you cannot have ground under you anymore and you're in the deep. That's faith. That's belief. That's trusting Him. And the Lord was trying to break through those barriers of security, which can so easily say, well, I, I'm too nervous to go forward. And we simply stay in the shallows. Let me tell you a story of a church in Cape Town, a little Methodist church. They had a hundred people. And God blessed this dear brother in the church. The church was growing, and it wasn't long before the church was packed to capacity. And they said, we've got to build a bigger church to see 300 people. We need that. And so they collected the money, and they challenged the people, and they did all sorts of things to bring in the money. And they, they just about had the money, and they're getting ready to plan the building of the church to see 300 people when they heard about a little African church in one of the African townships that was trying to build for just a few people. They got together and they said, how can we gather money for ourselves when they've got nothing? We'll have two services, but we're going to give this amount of money for them to build their church. And what a blessing. And so God blessed, and they overflowed. And the, twice, it, it, there were two services. And so they decided, you know, we've got to build a church sometime. We'll build a church for 600. It's going to cost X amount of money. We'll build it and uh, to the glory of God. And they saved up the money. 
and they were just about there when they heard of another little church over there. And it was sitting under, just in, under the trees. And they were wanting to build. They had nothing. And they said, how can we build a beautiful church when there's a brother and sister out there? They've got nothing. And so they gave them the money. And they built their church. And God blessed this church back home. It overflowed. And then they built a church to see the thousand. And God packed it out. And God gave them another church to build. What's that? It's called faith. It's called saying, I'm not here to serve just myself. I have a responsibility towards others. And we need to be stepping out in faith. And so the Lord says to Peter, launch out. My dear friends, that message still rings today. And missions around the world is looking for brothers and sisters who will learn the secret of launching out and attempting great things for God. And as a result, you'll find that His supply never, ever ends. Hallelujah! We serve a God that's got all that is needed for those who are willing to trust Him. Well, there was also thirdly the faith factor. And... Uh, the Lord Jesus says to Peter, launch out into the deep. He said, we've toiled all night. Now listen carefully. And the Lord Jesus said, at least Peter said, nevertheless, at thy word. There's the secret. We've got to get the nevertheless embedded in our souls. Because the very word nevertheless says, I can see the problem. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But you have spoken, and I'm going to move at your word. That moves it away from feeling. That's a man or a woman who gets a word from God, gets a promise from God, and moves forward and launches into the deep, whatever that represents in their lives. You see, that's faith. And then what was the result? We know it so well, don't we? There was a huge catch. That's just how Jesus works. Try and do it yourself, you won't catch much. But when you move in the will of God, the nets will break. Amen. Because he steps in. There was a little rebuke there, and I want you to notice uh, something very important. The Lord said, launch out into the deep and let down the nets, plural. Peter says, okay, Lord, I'll do it, but I'll let down the net, singular. Do you know that? Isn't that like you and me? Yes, we'll let down, but I'm not going to let down four nets. That's ridiculous. I'll just let down one and see what happens. We're all like that, aren't we? We move in the singular when he's moving in the plural. He's got bigger things in store. Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. What promise is that? A promise to forget or a promise to claim? Whether you're a church, whether you're a family, whether you're a businessman, whether you're a person launching out into your future, or you're at decisions dawn, you've got to make some decisions. Claim the promises and think big because he's a big God. Hallelujah. You've got nothing to worry about. And they formed a partnership. They absorbed others. The Baptists got the Methodists involved and the Presbyterians, and they were all catching fish there. There's just a tremendous splash of water as the Spirit of God comes, and people see what Jesus can do. His Word, His Word is sufficient. That's what we need as we go forward. And then there is a challenge. Peter, and Peter comes and says, Lord, I failed you. My faith was so small. I wanted to see that there was money in the bank before I took a step. I wanted to see that we had what was necessary before we launched out. He says, I'm a sinful man. Do you know what the sin was that he was guilty of right there? What would you think it was? It's called unbelief. Unbelief. And the Bible teaches us that unbelief is sin. Is sin. And if it, if it is sin, then it's got to be confessed. 
if we're going to go on with God. So here I am. I'm faced with a decision. I've got an issue. And God is speaking to me about it. He's challenging me to take a step of faith. And I hold back. And I say, no, no, no. And I'm practicing unbelief. Oh, I'm being reasonable, of course. But I haven't looked at, got a word from God. And God gives me a word. And suddenly I break out of this hold of unbelief that doubts and questions and says it can't be done. It goes against all our plans. And I move out of that situation and I take the steps of faith based on the Word of God. Don't do it without the Word of God. Otherwise you'll be in trouble. What a story of faith. What an explosion of faith. And the Lord says, Peter, this is just the beginning, man. I've got such plans for you. You're not going to just catch fish. You're going to be involved in catching men with the gospel. And a few years later, there on Times Square in Jerusalem, Peter stands up, and he stands up and boldly proclaims the word, and 3,000 fish jump into the nets. And I wonder if the Spirit of God just tapped him and said, Peter, do you remember at the lake? You remember on the seashore? Wasn't that good news? Wasn't that prophetical? What would have happened if you'd walked away from it? You would have missed what God has in store for you. If you learn the secret of walking by faith. Now there's another scene. We won't read to it. I'm going to just quote for you if you don't mind me because of time. Peter's involved again. And you'll remember Peter was a man who sometimes, as I said last night, opened his mouth and put his feet right inside and made it one big mess. And one day he said, Lord, if everybody else forsakes you, you can bank on me. And just hours later, you remember how he let his law down? When a little girl, girl said, aren't you also a Galilean? Aren't you one of his followers? I don't know him. He even used bad language, the Bible tells us, to get out of the situation. And then there was the crowing of the cock. And the Lord, in the midst of the trial, when all the accusations were being thrown on upon him, he turned round and his eye caught the eye of Peter. And the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Has he ever caught your eye? You ever been in that situation when you know his eye got hold of you and you knew you were failing? We all fail. Every one of us fails somewhere. But there is an eye that belongs to the Lord Jesus. It's a longing eye. It's a loving eye. It's an eye that pierces deep down and conveys a message. It'll get a grip of your life. I was once up in Zimbabwe, out in the bush country, and I saw a lion wanting to attack a deer. And what they do sometimes is the lion will stalk for a, and thirty yards away, he will he'll, he'll stare at that deer and catch his eye. And when he catches his eye, he mesmerizes him. He cannot move. And I watch that line and hold that deer 30 yards away, dead still, as he mesmerized him and came closer and closer and closer until he got him. The Lord Jesus wants to catch your eye so that he can get a hold of you and put his arms around you and show you that he loves you and wants to lift you up when you fail. And so, after the resurrection, Peter goes back to fishing. John chapter 21, he announces to the other guys, I am going fishing. And right there you see a problem because of the big eye. Eh? I wonder why he was going fishing. Maybe he'd just given up. 
Maybe he's going back to his old profession now. He said, I'm not going to make it. It's just, it's not going to work. The Lord has risen and he'll, he's going to ascend as that's what he said. So I'm just getting back into my old way of life. And they go out fishing and guess what happened that night? They caught nothing. And early the next morning as they're coming towards the coast of the Galilee, there's a man standing on the side of the road of the, of the sea. And he says, boys, have you caught anything? And they said, nothing. He said, cast your net on the right side of the ship. Do you remember that? And when they do it, 153 fish. They tell me in the Galilee, there's 153 different types of fish. The Lord knew exactly what he was doing. Peter says, it's the Lord again. Yeah, I can't run away. His eyes on me. He's got me. He jumps out the boat. You see, they had been fishing on the wrong side, like many of us. They were fishing in the flesh. They were fishing in a little bit of a reaction, maybe. Maybe they were saying, well, we're just going to do our own things. Forget about all we've been taught. We're going out fishing, and we don't need to even bother about all the things that the Lord said. He did say he's coming to Galilee, but we haven't seen him, so off we go. And that night they caught nothing. My friend, go fishing without Jesus, and you'll catch nothing. Spend a night trying to do your own thing, and you'll find Jesus is missing. But invite him into the boat. Invite him into the marriage feast of Canaan of Galilee, and, you'll move, and he'll move from being a guest into being the host of the, of the wedding, providing what was necessary by liquid refreshment far better than they'd ever had. If they'd left him just as a guest, it would never have happened. And there are those who are allowing Jesus to be a guest in their life instead of the host in charge of it all. And you'll catch nothing. You'll catch the things of this world, but not what God has for us. And when they get to the shore, the Lord Jesus is preparing a hearty breakfast for them. Fish fry, we call it. And they enjoy a meal. And they're all sitting around, and dear old Peter's sitting, and his head's down because he'd failed. And he was waiting for it, and when they'd all finished, the Lord said, Simon, Peter. And Peter said, yeah, it is. I'm in for it. And the Lord said, and Peter said, yes, Lord. Tell me what you think of me. He said, I want to ask you something. For them all to hear, do you love me? In Luke chapter 5, he was teaching them about faith. In John chapter 21, he's, he's going to teach him about love. And the two are inseparable. He might have had faith for some things, but there was a factor of love missing in his life. And so the Lord Jesus puts Peter through what we call a testing program. Three questions you asked him. And your pastor will know that in, in the original Greek there are several words for the word love in the Bible. The two main words that are used are the words phileo, and the other is the word agape. Okay? Now... What do they mean? The word phileo means I like you for what I can get out of you. Okay? Agape means I love you and I'm committed to you. That's a big difference there. When a couple gets married here in the front and the pastor standing in front of them, if they get married on the basis of phileo, that marriage will start off on shaky ground. You don't get married on phileo, I like you for what I can get out of you. That's a wrong basis for marriage to start with. Eh? But if there is a marriage that takes place on the basis of agape, which says, I love you because I'm committed to you. Then they've gone through a process of emotion, intellect, and now the will. And here in the front, they exchange wills, and two people become 
One flesh, the Bible teaches us. That's marriage. And marriage where agape is the overriding factor. They are glued together. They are bonded together. There's a connection there because of agape. Tremendous word. That's what the world is missing today. Everything is on filial basis and worse, the eros basis and so on. But agape is what will save a nation. Show me a church that doesn't practice agape. And you've got a club. You've got a gathering of people and they like it and they don't like it and they shout and scream and fight and perform and carry on and there's bitterness and splits in the church and so we go on. That's because they gather together on the basis of filial. And it's never been agape. Love suffers long and is kind. Bears one another's burdens. That's agape. And so the Lord looks at Peter. And here's the play on words that I want you to catch very carefully. Let me give it in the original translation. Simon Peter, do you agape me? That's what the Lord said to him. Do you know how he replied? Lord, I phileo you. I've been following you because I've liked to follow you. I've followed you because it's nice to follow you. I followed you because I've got a bit of popularity out of this. I've followed you on the basis of phileo, and you can see exactly why he failed. And there are many Christians today, that's where they are. They're living in the phileo and not in the agape experience. Second time round, Simon Peter, do you agape me? And he says, Lord, I'm afraid I phileo you. And dear old Peter's beginning to feel his heart being squeezed now. He's got nowhere to go. And then the Lord does an amazing thing. If you go into the original, you, 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 you'll know that. He changes the word, and he says, okay, let's change gears. Simon Peter, do you phileo me? Do you know what he was doing? He's coming down to his level. And he says, man, I want to meet you right there in your phileo, right there in your failure. I'm not going to stand up here and look down on you. I am going to come where you are, and I want to start a brand new relationship with you. When, as the Spirit gets hold of your life, you're going to move and function on the basis of agape. As you feed my lambs, and as you build them up in their most holy faith. And Peter goes through a transformation that prepared him for an infusion of the Holy Spirit that was going to come upon him in such a ma manner that from that moment when the crowds gathered and normally he would have run for his life like everybody else, he stands up and boldly proclaims the gospel of the Lord Jesus. His heart had been changed. He'd moved from Philea into agape and the love of Christ constrained him as he proclaimed the message. Now listen to what Jesus says. I want you to listen very carefully here. When the Lord Jesus had said that, he said, most, verse 18, most assuredly I say to you, yes, the Lord Jesus speaking strongly, firmly, but lovingly, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. Peter, you were hard-headed. Peter, you did your own thing. Peter, you were strong. You were self-willed. When you were young, you went your own way. But he said, when agape gets hold of your life, he says, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And the Bible says he spoke concerning the death that he would die. Do you know what happened? Peter had an experience with God where his life became absolutely saturated with the agape experience. And he loved and he loved. And the Lord said, in the process of time, you will come into the place where you will die 
Whereas beforehand, you would never have allowed anybody to take you to your death. You're going to go willingly. And you're going to be crucified. And tradition tells us he was such a broken man that he said, I am not worthy to be crucified as my Savior. Crucify me upside down. That's how he died. Now listen very carefully because this then becomes the reality. In a few chapters on in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter was taken prison, prisoner. Do you remember? Herod had just killed James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And he's getting ready to execute Peter. And the night before, the church had a so-called prayer meeting, but they didn't believe in, in, in answer prayer. They just believed in prayer. Well, that's not enough, as you know. And Peter is in jail, what? Fast asleep. One of, the, one of the gods says, Peter, aren't you, aren't you nervous? They're going to kill you tomorrow. He, they're going to behead you like they beheaded James. He said, oh, no, I'm not going to die tomorrow. He said, how can you say that? He said, because I know I'm going to, how I'm going to die. I'm going to die by crucifixion, and you haven't prepared for that. So I am not going to die tomorrow. Isn't that how God works? <laughs> and the next day... You'll know how he was, that night he was released completely. You see, that's when God comes. And you have moved quietly, and his Spirit has put in your heart love. And that love breathes in confidence and boldness. And that love knows how to trust God, and in God's own way, and in God's own time, he'll do what he promised he would do. Herod could never have killed old Peter if he wanted to the next day because Jesus had said, that's not the way you're going to die. And he died many years later as the pastor of the church. Agape. Agape. That's the way to go. I want to close with two stories and then hopefully have got the point across because I want to show you how God can work. First of all, let me show you how He can work in a miraculous way to encourage you. And then I want to tell you a little story about someone who exercised faith. Just listen carefully, and then we're through. There was a Muslim couple living in North Africa in a certain town. Absolute true story. I'm going to tell you as unbelievable as it is. And I cut it short to tell you, it came a time when the wife received Christ. Her husband refused to accept the Lord and took it out on his wife and beat her mercilessly. Every time she mentioned Jesus in the home, he smacked her. This poor woman suffered at the hand of a man who was ruthless in his attitude and behavior and how he dealt with his wife. And one day she learned about a, um, a ladies' conference, and she asked if she could go, and he said, no, you cannot go, and smacked her across the face. In spite of what she went through, she went to that conference. And when she left to go to that conference, that man went away to work and locked the door so that she could never get in again, and he would say to everyone, she left me, and she's gone. She's taken the key with her. And he went and took the key and threw it into the river on his way to work. She came home later, full of the joy of the Lord. She decides to bring him some food to show him love. And she goes to the market and she buys some fish and she, she makes, wants to prepare a meal. She cuts the fish open and guess what she finds inside the fish? A key. And she looks at that key and she says to her friend, but that key looks like the key of my, the door of my house. She goes and tries and the door opens. She said, I cannot understand this, but God knows why this has happened. Now this is absolutely true. I've read it from different sources again two weeks ago and ten years ago I heard about it. He comes home and he sees the door unlocked. He said, how on earth did you get in? She said, oh, I just opened the door with the key. He said, that key was thrown into the river. He said, God led me. Long story short, he said, I don't know this God, but I want to find him. He went to church and got saved, and today he's an evangelist. Hallelujah. Amen. What's God do? 
He does the impossible from time to time because He is God. He's a miraculous God. He can do anything. And He comes and He tests our faith. And then He wants us to bathe our lives with love. And then it is that only way by which people will know that we are His children. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye love one another. That's a God pain. One of my heroes, as far as missions is concerned, and you will have known about it, is Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the man who started the, uh, the Japan uh, mission to, where God put a burden on his heart to go to Japan and to serve the Lord. He applied with the organization to go. They said, no, you're not strong enough. You'll never make it. And so they disqualified him from going. He said, I know God has led me. And so he went off independently. He knew that the Spirit of God had prompted him. He had a group of people praying for him, and he caught the ship for both those days to go to Japan. It took over six months. And they came to an area near the East Indies Islands where the sailing boat experienced what every sailor dreaded, and that was the fact that there was no longer any wind that would blow them. And so they lowered the, the, the sails and hoped that a current would take them, and hopefully they wouldn't land on one of those islands where they would be uh, taken by some of the cannibals. And the captain came along and spoke to Hudson Taylor and said, Hudson, I believe that you follow God. He said, yes. He said, would you not pray that God would undertake and bring this boat with sail, with, 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 with the right wind, that we're able to save us from landing on the islands? He says, you want me to pray? He said, yes. He said, I'll pray if you'll set the sails. No, well, you can't do that because there's no wind. It's ridiculous. We can't put the sails up. He said, you set the sails, I'll pray, and we'll ask God to send the wind. And they set the sails. There was no wind. It seemed ridiculous, and sailors were laughing and jo joking and mocking. And he went down to his cabin, began to pray. Within 35 minutes, there was a, ha a gale. And they went down and said, okay, just take it easy. Don't, just leave it. That's enough. Tell God that's enough. <laughs> they, the, the, the gale came and just took them in the right direction. And that's the message that I want to leave with you tonight. He said, set the sails. If you set the sails, God will provide the wind. And I don't know what sails he wants you to set. There's some churches that have got to reset their sails. We've got to relook at our whole plan, our agendas, where we want to be in five years' time if Jesus hasn't come. We have to set our sails that the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow and move us into areas we've never been before. And we become a church that is more than a club, more than just a gathering, more than just a fun time, but a time where we are making an impact for all eternity and seeing the kingdom being extended. Set the sails. Sit with your agendas and say, what does God want us to do? Set the sails. And when we take that step of faith and set the sails, whether it's a church gathering, whether it's a family, setting the sails for the sake of the kingdom, the Spirit of the living God will come in gushing fashion and blow us and take us into areas and places we never dreamed of before. Set the sails. Do it by faith. And let God be God in your life and whatever you do. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that some truth may have settled upon our lives this evening. Where there has been little faith, come and baptize us with Holy Ghost faith to attempt great things. Your word says, call unto me, and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. Oh, God, save us from being static and make us dynamic. Help us, Lord, not to be passive but active. 
Help us, O oh God, to move forward with the spiritual times of our day. And then baptize us, I pray, with that holy, holy love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that we become men and women who love one another, love our families, love our enemies, love those who persecute us, showing love all the time, loving you, loving you, being dominated by love, going the extra mile, letting down the nets, launching out into the deep, motivated by the fact that the love of Christ constraineth me. Oh God, may we not be satisfied with the status quo, but raise up this gathering of people in this corner of your vineyard, I pray, to do exploits for God and for the sake of the kingdom, that hell may be emptier and heaven fuller as a result of combined efforts in Jesus' name. And if, Lord, we need to come confessing unbelief, confessing carnal thinking, confess, confessing decisions in the flesh, our lack of faith, our letting down one net when you're calling us to let down many, then may we perhaps indicate that to you as we close this service with a bended knee and a broken heart and a new surrender to the sweet will of God. We're going to close in a moment as we sing. And if God has touched your heart in some area, I invite you to come. There's an altar that's waiting for you to show your dedication and your commitment and your need of Jesus in your life. If you need to talk to your pastor, you talk to him. Let's stand as we sing together in response to the word tonight. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. So
all the way there. So you think about that when you give. Uh, to the, I, I just I thank the Lord for Brother Harold and his ministry. Let me pray over this offering. Father, we do love you. We thank you for what we've heard tonight. God, we take it and ponder it in our heart. Lord, if we were one of those who he said, follow me. And we know that these in this room, Lord, maybe all of them have followed. God, are we going where you're going? Is our heart where your heart is? Do we have our nets to be those fishers of men? Are we willing to surrender all to you and go where you lead and do what you say? Oh, God, help us to be people who walk by faith. Even as we collect this offering now, Lord, we ask you to speak to us about what to give, how to give. God, that we may be a blessing to this dear brother who the scripture says the laborer is worthy of his wages. God, we want to help him do this ministry. Help him move on down the road. So God, help us know how to help him. God, bless this offering. Bless those who give it. In Jesus' name. Amen.